today is a uh, really very special day for all of us because uh, this is uh, uh, in memory of uh, Professor Rajasri Basu. Professor Rajasri Basu, I had the privilege of uh, knowing her. We are friends. Uh, and uh, even though my subject is economics, but uh, I came to know of her, uh, her teaching and uh, her areas of interest. So we in invited her to teach a few, uh, to give a few lectures for our MPhil in Development Studies uh, students. And she immediately obliged. And she, in fact, gave these lectures for a couple of years. So. Uh, I feel that it's a privilege to know her and her erudition and her uh, ability to teach and uh, an interdisciplinary uh, group of students. And uh, Professor Basu was eminently uh, successful in, in sort of uh, communicating to students from different disciplines. So uh, it's, a, it's a really... Uh, I am happy that uh, the Department of Political Science and also uh, the Council for uh, Political Studies, uh, they have thought about uh, organizing this series of uh, lectures uh, in her memory. Uh, today's lecture is uh, going to be given by uh, Professor Shorin Bhattacharya, as you know, and it's a very nice uh, uh, introduction by Professor Dattagupta, and uh, as he said that, uh, you know, Shorin Babu was a uh, kind of role, role model for, for us, I mean, in our generation also, I mean, I belong to, again, an earlier generation, and when still, uh, uh, you know, uh, we had this uh, a kind of wider canvas and uh, to talk about things which uh, went beyond uh, the technicalities of economics. And uh, so Professor Shorin Bhattacharya was a kind of role model for us that particularly through his writings, uh, and, uh, and uh, we learned a lot from his writings. So uh, uh, it's a real uh, privilege to be here today, and I thank uh, Department of Political Science and Council, of, Council for Political Studies, my friend Samad and Professor Dr. Gupta, for giving, this, uh, for giving me this opportunity to be here. I take it as a great honor to be here. Uh, so with these few words, uh, I would like to invite Professor Bhattacharya uh, to, to present his lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you all for all this almost embarrassingly kind introduction. Now first, uh, let, let me recall, I am not exactly a newcomer in this department or in this kind of program here. I recall that I once talked on, in the occasion, on the occasion of Chandan Bhattacharya Memorial Lecture. Even before that though, Shobhan Mabu uh, says that it was not exactly a part of that series, I also had the opportunity to deliver one uh, Buddhadev Bhattacharya Memorial Lecture over there, the other room. Yes. So I'm not exactly a newcomer here, and I have many friends in political science, also a few students as well. And in fact, I cherish that background that I was uh, talking while we were coming over here. That in our days, at least in the undergraduate stage, we used to have political science and economics combined. And I still consider the separation, the stitch separation that had taken place later on, is a loss perhaps on both sides. But certainly on economic side that I can take some responsibility of. Uh, I'm afraid that also on political science side as well. There is no point really in having this distinction that one who chooses to do economics must be totally unaware of the concept of what a state is. And in fact, you know that in economics classes, we often have to face questions like this, and always not from students only, also from colleagues sometimes. Sir, how do you define definition? 
what is the definition of democracy questions like this so i don't think that that was a very wise decision true that the subject is expanding one has capacities one has individual capacities so i always have thought about myself to be both a student of economics and political science and social sciences in general and in fact i in my early teaching career i also uh, for some time had taught political science classes more specifically i used to take classes on indian constitution and i was fortunate to be taught indian constitution by a teacher professor sushil kumar sen who was passionately involved in this younger brother of dr dhirendra mohan sen uh, dhirendra nath sen so i had really uh, an interest in indian constitution which i still continue to uh, pursue in my own capacity now <clears throat> coming to the subject today i uh, one, one more thing Uh, when shoran babu invited me i only knew that this is going to be a part of this free lecture series marks by centennial but i was not told anything about that it was also going to be a lecture in memory of rajasri bosh uh, i should have known that by that time so i am also uh, i i recall i have this opportunity i didn't know her personally but i used to know her in a way and i also deeply felt about that that bad incident when it took place so i have very live memories of all these things i just this afternoon i knew that this is also a part of rajasri boshu memorial lecture i didn't uh, know at all anyway now coming to the subject matter of today's lecture uh, i give the title capital nature of the text so this is not really a lecture on capital but i wish to say something wish to share something with you uh, in a somewhat rambling manner and you uh, know and perhaps you have already guessed that i have no prepared lecture in that sense today i only uh, did this short note uh, supplied as an abstract but then i have some rough notes and Uh, something so you will excuse if i become somewhat rambling this afternoon but i wish to uh, share some of my uh, intimate personal positions about marx in general about the nature of the text capital and this i feel important based on my experience of having given the opportunity in my department there at jadavpur of teaching capital as a text over roughly about two decades i was given this responsibility when you know our dear friend no longer now professor kollan dotto who was a practicing marxist he was a political activist was our senior colleague and friend was personally very had personal very intimate relations with all of us he used to teach for a long time marx in our department and in our department there was something special that also needs to be uh, uh, shared here clearly it was there right from 1956 and was an idea as far as i know uh, that amartya sen personally wanted to Uh, involved in the department that was we had a full paper in the undergraduate courses we roughly described that as classical political economy it was a paper involving adam smith david ricardo and karl marx and the whole idea was that these authors are to be are at least supposed to be taught somewhat textual now you know that this is an absurd proposition to teach an undergraduate student adam smith ricardo and marx all together in one paper of 100 marks and that also expected to be taught textually so as you know that that did not happen here 
for most of the period that did not happen what happened was that more or less summary treatments of adam smith dick and marx but that was really taken to be a lovely paper in the department and we many of us had a bad feeling about it that uh, justice was not really being done to the subjects or to the paper or whatever and for students you know that uh, in the 60s in the 70s and things really did change substantially when we started teaching in the late 50s and when we left the profession towards the end of the 20th century things had undergone radical changes in terms of the mindset of the department of the colleagues of the students all around so it happened that by that time smith ricardo marx all appeared to be very old people what's the point in having them uh, full hundred marks and i distinctly recall one of our students asking a question at the time of their viva voce test you know that at jadavpur i don't know exactly what happens now in earlier structure after the written examinations were over the students both at the undergraduate and at the postgraduate level had to take a viva course of 20 marks now i distinctly recall asking this student uh, a question like this you to tell me one thing you no marks you have been taught marks in your paper 6 that was paper 6 in our undergraduate course and it was something around 70s or 80s you have the name of marks written all over all the walls in the city what is your feeling do you think that the marks that you are taught in the classroom and the marks that you see written and drawn on the city walls are they the same person she took a few minutes time and then said rather hesitantly sir perhaps yes i said very well so she had at least that feeling so we could think ourselves to be successful at least up to that point that these are not two different persons <clears throat> now pardon me if i become somewhat personal today because uh really there is i i don't find there's much point in giving a full uh uh sermonizing academic lecture this afternoon so i will really share some of my intimate uh feelings and uh positions here with you now we took some some time and we prepared ourselves and we took some kind of a private pledge that we will teach smith ricardo and marx uh, textually as far as possible because that was a paper as i understand that omarth sen introduced here it was directly taken from the political economy tradition of oxford cambridge style so these things had to be done and omarth sen used to emphasize one point while formulating the syllabus uh, a kind of relevance his category was relevance and you know that during the 50s our student days in economics also perhaps in political science uh, things were moving in a direction and later on i find that to be a deep methodological influence of the rise of positivist tendencies positivist methodologies and even many of the philosophy students they were also cultivating studies of direct symbolic logic introduction of mathematical inputs etc etc that was the spirit of the 1950s and in the 1950s when we were students some of our senior students some of the brilliant names were obviously shukumar chakraborty and amarth sen they were just three academic batches senior to us so we used to be moved by their academic brilliance since when they were undergraduate students here so uh, in other parts of the city in other different colleges we used to uh, also know right from that time what they were doing what they were thinking about etc and what they were concerned with so in the atmosphere of the 1950s things in economics particularly 
were moving very, very fast towards, let's put it bluntly, mathematizing the discipline. And in our undergraduate days, the syllabus was also of the old style. And in fact, the subjects that are usually known as microeconomics and macroeconomics today were unknown in our times, in the undergraduate days. What we know as microeconomics today used to be described as either general economic theory or simply general economics. And what we describe as macroeconomics today at that time used to be described as simply money. Whatever it may mean, we do not know, but we know that it was the paper on money. But things were changing. Things were changing rather fast. And at that time, we also were uh, given to understand that you have to uh, you have to have a kind of inferiority feeling if you are not adequate enough in mathematical methods and mathematical uh, techniques. So we started learning and very personally speaking in my undergraduate days I didn't have mathematics as my subsidiary subject. In our times we used to call it past subject. I studied history and I found history as an important uh, associate discipline with both political science and economics. But then I had to do some mathematics later on. I did also some formal courses. That's a different story. So this methodological turn that economics was turning to be a science and then some of you certainly know that there was a very powerful, significant uh, methodological movement on the international level, as a part of which they used to bring about books with a title uh, on the top of the books. The slogan, it was something like a slogan, Unified Science Movement all was unified science. They really had entertained and it was a directly a follow-up of the terrible influence of logical positivism at that time. That things all must be made to look respectable science. So, and in that series they used to bring about books on physics, books on chemistry, books on biology. These are mostly North Holland publications and also books on the science of economics. And there was at least one clear title of econometrics. Econometrics was also very new at that time. And we were one of the first batches to be taught econometrics formally. But I should hasten to add that the econometrics that we were taught at that time was so elementary. It was only Tinbergen's book. And our professor would, used to say that the first 50 pages of Tinbergen's book has the cream of econometrics. And the background of that statement was that he himself was said so by none other than Tinbergen himself. And you know that many of our social science students at that time would uh, used to go to that Rotterdam School of Social Sciences and were directly Tinbergen's students. So that was the kind of uh, background under which we emerged and we developed. So econometrics was a very had a very respectable position at that time. Now, in our preparation for this uh, subject, for this paper, Adam Smith, Ricardo, and Marx, I took responsibility mostly of Marx, some of our colleagues. Adam Smith, some other had Ricardo, though we had interchanged our subjects also. I taught Smith for quite some time, Ricardo for a shorter period, uh, and I am not that great a lover of Ricardo, very frankly speaking. As I said that I will be sharing some of my personal feelings as well. And now I feel uh, that um, Ricardo, you know, had a tremendously important impact 
on the later development of economic theory. And in fact, it didn't develop along the lines of Adam Smith, nor of, certainly not of Marx. It did develop in the line of Ricardo. Perhaps it would be, uh, it's very difficult to say whether it would be better, at least it would be something very different had it uh, developed along the lines of Adam Smith, Marx and all that. Now, while preparing, we used to, as far as it was possible for us, to learn the subject first textually, and I tried to study Marx capital textually, but very soon we felt a difficulty and we uh, had to admit that this is a very uh, important limitation that we are learning it through English translation without having any access to the German language original. Next, now my embarrassment begins. I had right at that time uh, really significant difficulties about that hyphen which I call my project I call dehyphenating project. Marx Engels hyphen. Now, in, in, in an uncritical manner, we always refer to these texts, we use these texts as <coughs> Marx Engels. <coughs> and the famous mega series also has the title Marx Engels Collected Works. <coughs> the texts that are clearly attributed to Engels, the texts that are clearly attributed to Marx, if one goes somewhat carefully into those texts, one is bound to be struck with the fact that the style of writing, the way of developing the arguments, and the overall vision for the society, for the topics under discussion, in Marx and in Engels are clearly different. And their backgrounds, everybody knows, were so different. One was a professionally taught philosopher. And having done his PhD work in that difficult area of Democritus and uh, Epicurus. The other one, without no question of showing disrespect, the other one was much nearer to the world of business, the world of practical affairs. Came to know the British working class development much more thoroughly. Came to know the nitty gritty of the industrial civilization much more intimately, quite so. But it is one thing to be, uh, to be conversant with the detailed working of a certain phenomenon, with a certain social situation, and to be able to look at it with any kind of meaningful philosophical vision. Now, with that feeling, I started doing capital and I used to teach my students and to be very frank with you, what I used to do, you know that uh, capital is an unmanageable text. First of all, three, first three volumes of capital. You look at the arrangement of the topics, quite unmanageable. And it is sheer cruelty to hand it over to an undergraduate student and to say that you read Marx textually. So I adopted this strategy. I used to uh, make a kind of, uh, kind of something like an almanac, something like a catalog of the different topics dealt with by Marx and in which their distribution over the different volumes and within the volumes also their distribution over different sections and chapters, almost totally haphazard. Quite so, uh, though this is also true that volume one, certainly much more organized, much more easily, not easily, at least reasonably manageable as compared to the volumes two and three, which were clearly published later on by uh, Engels after Marx's death. And then, with this kind of feeling in my mind, when I was acquainted with, in connection with our 
সামহাট অ্যাবর্টেড গ্রামসি প্রজেক্ট উইথ শোভনলাল দত্তগুপ্ত অ্যান্ড সমিক বন্দ্যোপাধ্যায় ওয়েন আই বিকেম অ্যাকোয়েন্টেড উইথ দ্যাট কনসেপ্ট ইন গ্রামসি হু ইনসিস্টেড অন দিস কনসেপ্ট অব ডিপ্লোম্যাটিক এডিশন অব মার্কস অ্যান্ড বাই দ্যাট হি মেন্ট এ কেয়ারফুলি স্ক্রুটিনাইজ সিস্টেড টেক্সট অব মার্কস which is somewhat unadulterated. And in fact, at that time, I was also uh, not so aware of the importance of this category of diplomatic edition, which I came to know later on. This diplomatic edition and the adjective diplomatic, we normally would tend to take in the sense of diplomatic as we use it today. No, it was not in that sense at all. It was in the sense of diplomatics, then the adjective as diplomatic diplomatics derives from the word diploma which literally means a sheet of folded paper and there is a whole discipline in the context of you might call it textual criticism or you might call it the theory of the text and so on and so forth <coughs> diplomatics refers to an area of study which has its business, the examination, careful scrutiny of uh, ancient texts, of doubtful texts, to examine for its authenticity, and particular, and, and you know the relation with diplomatics, and this also has a relation with the current use of diplomatic as well. You send an ambassador to a foreign country with credentials signed, papers made by his or her authority, king or sovereign or queen or president or whoever. Now, the receiving country on the receiving end, the paper's authenticity has to be examined. Now, at times that becomes quite a difficult exercise. Gramscian use of the idea of diplomatic text was in that context. And Gramsci, as far as I know, Gramsci didn't clarify the idea, or maybe he may have clarified somewhere else, but we are not aware of that. But it appears that uh, this has, uh, to translate it in our personal terms, my, uh, that hyphenated expression. Perhaps Gramsci's anxiety was to be uh, able to be in a position where he could Uh, separate Marx from Engels. And this, to me, personally, becomes very important because you know that in uh, our ordinary readings of these areas, anyone will have this experience, that when I am discussing or criticizing some of Marx's postulates, some of Marx's propositions, I almost freely interchange, use the quotations, either from Marx or from Engels. And in many cases, more from more often from Engels rather than from Marx. And I was personally uh, <coughs> uh, really, uh, it, it, was, it was quite striking when I first discovered that even Karl Popper, in his poverty of historicism, while criticizing Marx, I feel quite unjustly, on you know which occasion, Marx was being criticized by Popper in that context as to the point that Marx's value theory was not good enough because it lacked any reference to the demand side of the problem. For, or coming from a person like Popper, this was really unfortunate because the whole problematic of the problem of value in classical political economy was something that it didn't warrant any direct, major, important reference to the idea of demand at all. Because it was not a question of determining the market price. The whole idea of value was different. You know what was happening. In the meantime, in the discipline of economic theories, the whole ascendancy was won over by what we could call, at one time we would use to say, marginalist economics. Now, more popularly, we would perhaps say neoclassical economics or whatever. So the whole idea was that whenever we use the word value, 
we are at the back of our mind really referring to the price the market price and things like demand and supply determination of the equilibrium prices and so on and so forth. that was a kind of thing that methodologically pervaded this areas of our study so in my humble way or in our humble way we wanted to uh, set these things uh, right and i will honestly tell you here this afternoon that we used to devote lectures after lectures to separate make a separation isolate the concept of value and price and you know that in economics classes they are often used as almost interchangeable and as a matter of fact in the early days of the development of marginalist economics even respectable texts were being titled theory of value but they were dealing with really the three theory of prices that happened so this kind of confusion at the level of deep ideas that prevailed when i was personally going through these troubles these difficulties these confusions a rare opportunity came my way right here in this city we had for one afternoon just one afternoon half a day not even a full day an occasion when the then deputy director of marx engels archives in moscow visited this city and visited our university for a couple of hours or so and it was a very hurriedly organized group about 15 or 20 of some of our colleagues and maybe one or two students now <clears throat> the deputy director spoke in russian aided by a translator <clears throat> uh it appeared to us and it was something somewhere in the middle of the uh, middle of the 80s so the question of the dissolution of the soviet system was not even in sight though difficulties were cropping up uh, critical approaches were being discussed but not really the idea of dissolution now the lecture directly appeared to be a kind of routine affair and you know the russians kind of haranguing speeches around that thing it was something like that so we were not very impressed but some of us we were waited to take this opportunity if we could raise this question we could what would be your position to a proposal of separating marx's writings from engels's writing how important do you think this proposition would be pause for a while and then just dismiss the question no we don't consider that to be important so that was the official position of the marx engels archives of the soviet union even towards the middle or uh, late 80s so that was and you know that uh, uh, anything in connection with marx engels or marxian theories had these difficulties every issue has deep political connotations every issue has deep political controversies and once you come to the question of ground level politics fisticuffs will begin immediately so there is no way of dealing with uh, patient theoretical questions now i have let me be frank really many items on my private agenda i have hidden agenda and thanks to shobhan lal or our common friend prolhad kumar sarkar we often have these opportunities of discussing or talking about marx or marxian things i try to bring about some of these ideas but uh, it's not fair uh, and not possible to uh, make it plain or open every time now here i have noted some of the items of my personal agenda which i try to follow i do not know and i know that at this age it will not be possible for me to uh, pursue this agenda to the end 
my very first point is something embarrassingly difficult the question of change and understanding as you know that famous theoretical uh, uh, 11 thesis of thesis on firebach shobhanlal may perhaps recall even now i do recall uh, even in that seminar uh, by prallad babu i said something on this number 11 itself now and it was later on known in our current series of mega by current i mean the usual known mega series not the new one the word however between two commas with editorial note it's now known that it was inserted by engel i tried to develop an argument like this that when you put the word however between these two commas the uh, the philosophers have interpreted the world so far the point however is to change it that means that interpreting the world and changing the world are as though two opposite ends is there any meaning really in such an understanding now true we do try to understand we do try to change we try to change because we wish to live we have to live well and we try to understand because we have to live well so these are all connected processes now note that the standard ways in which marxian ideas or ideas that usually are paraded as marxian ideas are very very often put in this cut and dried fashion you think of the base superstructure question here is the base there is the superstructure the superstructure is raised on the base and you all know about the controversies that uh, develop in the western socialist circles after marx's death and so much so so much it was generated that engels had to intervene you know that famous letter where he had to say that well it was in the end after all basically they are interacting neither marx nor i had anything more to say now what's wrong if we feel it this way that these are all interconnected things our whole life process is interconnected and it's our convenience it's basically due to the limitation of our mental power it's basically due to many difficulties even organizational administrative difficulties that we have a department of political science in one room a department of economic science in another room a department of physics here a department of chemistry over there the nature goes on together the biosphere the non biosphere the social sphere everything goes on in a connected manner but we uh, we we put so much emphasis on that idea of being separated making it cut and dry because i think basically due to our limitation of uh, our intellectual uh, limitation that I, we cannot manage all that thing together very well recognize that we cannot manage but we need to manage therefore our methodologies should be uh, worked out in a way that may or that should leave room for certain things which we at the moment cannot manage but we know that that demands being managed now here in this spirit i have one sentence i have written here this is a very well known quotation from althusser in althusser's for marx you know althusser is almost castigating marx in more specifically Uh, to to put it more specifically in the context of that debate between young marx and the mature marx and you know that the kind of political heat that was generated in that con- in that context young marx the advocates of young marx thesis were all counter revolutionaries and all that and the real genuine revolutionary spirit lies in emphasizing only the mature marx every question you can take up and that was the okay. in the context of asian mode of production in the context of almost everything now in that context althusser quotation was althusser was castigating marx like this 
look at the strong uh, the, the terms in which he is uh, criticizing. Just one sentence. Or if he, means Marx, stubbornly insists on his age. There is a division between young Marx and the mature Marx. Then, if Marx stubbornly insists, and insists on his age, let him admit, let Marx admit, the sins of his maturity. What are the sins? Let him recognize that he sacrificed philosophy to economics, ethics to science, man to history. He sacrificed. That is, uh, young Marx had all these things. Young Marx, at least up to this point, Althusser felt that young Marx had uh, philosophy, not just economics, had ethics, not just science, had man, not just history. These were the sins that mature Marx, according to Althusser at that point of time. Now, coming to the sin that Althusser committed. What happens after... Uh, uh, Shobhanlal might tell me more clearly. I'm not exactly sure about the uh, exact time when uh, this thing appeared. But after all, what was the later development of Althusser himself? He will castigate anybody who would be arguing in favor of any kind of humanist marks, any kind of other than quote-unquote non-science marks. Because by that time, Althusser had fixed himself to the position. Even a bad word may, have, may, may be said to have fossilized himself to the position that uh, uh, anything that will indulge in humanism of Marx, in other words, the young ideas or ideas of young Marx would ultimately uh, turn critical to the ruling practice of Soviet Union, ruling practice of the quote-unquote the communist systems and so on and so forth, which had to be kept as something pure, as something sacrosanct. So even when Althusser criticizes and feels that ethics is important, not all science. Man is important, not all history. Philosophy is important, not all economics. Now then come to my final observations and then, if possible, some open questions and answers. Now coming to the text of capital. Capital, you know, as far as I know, or you might be able to say more clearly. Uh, certainly it is not uh, taken to be a teachable subject in any department other than economics, if at all in economics even. So, so capital, we regard that to be an economics text. Capital, we regard that to be a subject within political economy. Because, as I have written in this note that has been circulated, when Volume 1 of Capital appeared in 1867, it could naturally be looked upon as an expanded version of his uh, contribution to the critique of political economy of 1859. Political economy by that time as a distant discipline had established itself through the works of Smith, Ricardo, John Stuart Mill and such other persons belonging to the, the tradition of English political economy. They had their French counterpart in Bastiat and Say, and there was also the physiocratic tradition of thought, which had impacted the classical ideas. So it was not unusual, I admit that it was not unusual, that capital would be taken up as a political economy text in the first instance. So in the first instance, there is nothing wrong, there is nothing unusual, that capital is regarded as a political economy text. But that should not be the end of it. That is my point. My point is that there is possible, it is important that we do it that way, and otherwise I think the dimensions of capital as a text also will not be, uh, will not be able to capture that, all those dimensions. Capital has to be taken, has to be not, not taken, capital has to be read philosophically. And if you really come to think of Marx, 
would you really uh, would you really take this position that it is very substantial to insist on that this is a political economy text that is a philosophy text that is a politics text all these things would you really go in for 18th brumaire without having all the input that you get from marx's ideas and look that you do not get these inputs from engels really from engels you cannot come to that range because engels will uh, will limit you to the ways the working class development is going on now my one private question that i always refer to i have also asked shobhanlal dot so let me see what is his answer today i am not quite sure now when we talk about young marx certainly a very important text is that economic and philosophy manuscripts the peru manuscripts of 1844 the source book let us say of the idea of alienation which uh, later on had been given so much importance and all that and when in 1844 those manuscripts were being written it is known that marx and engels were together in paris for about a week but it is not known at least not to me i ask very honestly and frankly this assembly here what is our position to this question did engels ever know of this text i really do not know this was everybody knows that that was published much later on but was the existence of this text known to the engels at all now that week that peri week i tried to the available literature as far as is possible i tried to scan through it engels while <coughs> uh, marx and engels were together in peri for about a full one week then <coughs> Engels proceeded to Germany, Marx to somewhere else, maybe Brussels or somewhere. There is no evidence that while Marx was within that text, the Paris manuscripts, they were discussing theoretical, philosophical, political issues, and you were within such an important text, and you were not discussing or having anything to talk with your closest friend. This is somewhat unimaginable. now could it be that marx was as you know that marx's practice was that he was always thinking about these things mulling these ideas writing haphazardly uh, even unfinished sentences it was then being manufactured so to say within his brain uh properly may not be uh, made available may not be to be made available to others to outsiders or i do not know was marx uh, diffident about openly talking about something to do with uh, alienation an idea in the hegelian context that what that at that time would necessarily have spiritual connotations religious connotations christian connotations and all that so rather to play a safe game not now not now i do not know what is the problem now if you ever can uh, get to know i would be really interested in having this answer i do not personally have this answer now that did engels ever come to know of the existence of these manuscripts and the question is important because uh, the alter circulation that i have given here just now that was also in the theoretical context it was in the context of that famous althusserian concept of epistemological break for marx he postulated thought about an epistemological break between the young and young ideas and the later ideas and that perhaps is the spirit that is contained in uh, in the editing of the our present volumes available volumes of mega because you I, i have pointed out to this sentence from the blurb blurb of the current mega 
within court. The texts in volumes 28 to 37, full 10 volumes of the current mega, represent the principal stages in the formation of Marxist economic doctrine. Unquote. In other words, would it be wrong to suppose that from the point of view of the editors of the current mega series, those 10 volumes in the Marx Engels collected works, they comprise, mostly at least, the more important ones at least, of Marx's economic doctrine. Therefore, can we not possibly argue that from the point of view of these mega editors, the Perry manuscripts do not form a part of Marx's economic doctrine? Perhaps the mindset was that the question of alienation, Perry manuscripts and all that, that belonged to maybe his philosophical doctrine. But the, uh, the question must not escape anybody's notice that the manuscripts talked about the labor process, talked about the way labor is to perform under capitalist systems of production, etc. So the idea was that the alienation that Marx is thinking about now, the idea of alienation that Marx is perhaps slowly approaching towards, and really that is bringing alienation from divinity too, right here on this sphere of art, our day-to-day -day life processes, that it is through a particular configuration of our property structure, a particular process of the organization of our modes of production, that one who is directly involved in the process of production gets alienated from not only its fruits, from not only its quote-unquote profit aspects, from everything. It's not his. In other words, he gets himself deeply alienated. And uh, we can link it to, uh, if you go back, we can link it to uh, Adam Smith's idea of division of labor. Adam Smith's famous example in his Wealth of Nations of that uh, production of the pin, uh, uh, ordinary pin. It could be divided, Adam Smith says, into as many as, just a simple pin, as many as 20 or 24 processes. One is uh, elongating the strip. One is just putting forward that dot on the top of the pin. And you get to, you get to, your production, a living human being with all the living faculties is reduced to a position where you are doing only this thing, only this thing. Think of that Chaplin sin that you are doing this, you are doing this. So this deep idea, and which is a statement in philosophical anthropology, this is a statement on the condition of man. That was perhaps what Marx was visualizing. He had to write capital in order to visualize that condition of human being under this system of organization of production and the property structure. So it was nothing unusual that the so-called quote-unquote philosophical doctrines and the quote-unquote economic doctrines have to be taken together, have to be considered together. So the whole Marx, maybe that one individual cannot manage the whole of Marx. And you know that it was an impossible task, the drafts, the different manuscripts, the different versions, the different repetitions, everything. So the, uh, the total, the whole project and if you just go through the name indices, in the index you will find names which would not carry anything today in our uh, current, uh, uh, current readership because we do not know those names. Even minor pamphleteers find uh, reference there. So that is my spirit of the argument. I will end now by just mentioning one small point, two to three minutes. Uh, so in my hidden agenda, one is de-hyphenating Marx and Engels, uh, uh, making a whole mess of Marx's writings, his philosophy, his politics, his economics, his, his literature, even his poetry, 
when he was writing poetry, he was absolutely passionate in his poetry. And in his poetry one finds that he is uh, he's passionately graf uh, grappling with Kant and Hegel. And his position was there, that it's now the battleground. The battleground is now the theoretical ground. He is grappling with uh, Kant and Hegel. Now, in our quote-unquote mature study of Marx, how much of emphasis do we ascribe to uh, studying the impact of Kant Hegel's on Marx? Not much. And these are somewhat uh, anathemical ideas. It's not quite proper that while you are doing about or talking about Marx, you every moment move into the spheres of Kant and Hegel. There are instances where Kant and Hegel Im impact are studied. There are versions of austere Marxism and so on. But it's not the mainstream way of Marxian studies. Now, my last point is this, that Marx very certainly can be credited with this attempt to lay the foundations of a genuine social science. Marx was doing genuine social science. By genuine I mean it is the scientific study or it is the study simply. It is the study simply of man in society, of the whole man, of the whole society, not of this or that particular. What we have done? We have specialized branches within social sciences. Now, incidentally, this is something that I touched upon even in Buddha the Bhattacharya lecture here. So, for me really, social science always should be looked upon as one integrated thing. Maybe that one individual cannot manage the whole of it. That's a different issue. But it must be integrated in our mindset. That was a spirit that you can take from Marx. Now, once we come to this, I think it brings us face to face with a larger issue. Uh, where do we really situate Marx in respect of the whole Enlightenment project. The whole Enlightenment project, which uh, prioritizes reason, Enlightenment reason, and look that the prioritizing is so serious that it not only prioritizes reason, it deprioritizes other kinds of, call it feelings, emotions, etc., etc. So, once again, that kind of disharmony, that kind of imbalance developing deeply within our mindset, within our methodological premises, within our theoretical practices, it persuades to our, pervades to our theoretical practices. Now, I seriously believe that that also needs to be corrected. And there are ways, there are earlier strands of thought which can be uh, brought parallel if we take these things as parts of our project now. Enlightenment is an interesting thing in the sense that you all know that right with the emergence of the Enlightenment project itself, there also emerged critiques, very important critiques of this Enlightenment project. One important name, right in the 17th century, would be the Italian Vico. And I have a suspicion that Gramsci comes from that whole area of Vico, Machiavelli and all that. So, Gramsci comes to these ideas. Now, from Vico the adjective is something like Vician or something like that, isn't that? It's not Vico one, it is something like that. Now, those Vico ideas, Vico had also a problematic relation with the Enlightenment project. He was, in a sense, yes, a part of the Enlightenment project. Vico is not without reason. Vico is not against reason. Vico is not wild enough. He is quite reasonable, he is within Enlightenment. But at the same time, he is aware of different limitations of the Enlightenment project 
with that uh, disharmonious emphasis on reason alone. And Vico was one who must be associated with the emergence of the whole idea of social science. I am now talking not about the discipline of social science, the idea of social science. So to build up the idea of social science as different from science, and Vico calls his magnum opus the new science. So what was that new science? The new science was that uh, social science. So if we can link Marxian project, Marxist project, with this kind of project, rather than the positivist tendencies, rather than the typical economic science tendencies, and dealing with the economic science tendencies, what has happened to in the current state of things? All Marxist projects, all Marxist propositions have to be studied as demonstrable propositions in our ordinary sense of the economic science. And you have the text of formalizing Marxist models, formalizing Adam Smith's model, formalizing Ricardian models. And for Marx, there are any number of important, powerful texts, even from Morishima, a full mathematized Marx. The question is not really being mathematized or not being mathematized. The question is the moment you are formalizing that thing. To, mean, to, to make a certain thing formal means that you are abstracting away from many elements inherent in the, uh, in the conceptualization of the concrete thing. And that was a point. Marx directly hadn't much to say with regard to methodologies that he perceived. But in Grundrisse, there is one full section devoted to methods of method, devoted to methods. And there, one thing is very clear. All Marx's ideas are not very clear, not very transparent. But one thing is very clear there, that you have a concrete reality before you. To study it, because of the limitations of our brain power, we have to abstract away from this and that. Which elements should we leave out depends on our particular problem, depends on our taste, depends on our theoretical, political and other kinds of situations, depends on... That is our business. How I abstract, that is my business. How he would abstract, that would be his business. So, the stamp of the individual who is theorizing is to be found in the way you are concretizing. And then once you have, <coughs> in the way you are abstracting. And then once you have studied your abstract methods, you have to go back. You have to take a back journey. And you have to go back to the concrete itself. Uh, Applying this idea, this notion to Marx's capital as a text, look that because of our practices of taking it as a political economy text, what we have done? We have known that this is a text that gives us a discussion about the possible contradiction between labor and capital. Uh, let us see what happens to that. And our Basic anxiety is to be sure about the inevitability of the abolition of the capitalist system. You think of the whole literature dealing with the breakdown controversy, which is not really Marx's almost at all. Marx never talks about that kind of inevitable collapse of the capitalist system. All he says is always marked with tendencies, possible tendencies, falling rate of profit, there are these major tendencies. Right after that, there are these counter possible tendencies which may work in the opposite direction. So this is all tentative. This, we have lost that character in order to search according to our feel of that certainty. So if we, if we move away, if we can restrict ourselves from reading capital as a text of demonstrable economic propositions, we have to be comfortable with tentative statements, ad-oppositions, uh, uh, for the moment, 
and you think that is the style of capital as a text because in volume 1 you don't have much on rent why because it has been abstracted the principal relations the principal uh, contradictions are between labor and capital what by that marx means what marx means that at that point of history that was the kind of uh, tension that is developing that doesn't mean that landlord is abolished that doesn't mean that that is not there so in later on now that it comes later on marx has no responsibility in bringing that to volume 3 because that is the responsibility of the later editors look now comes the question of the diplomatic edition unfortunately in his span of 65 years he could do only that much that he could do and what he could do it is abs almost absurd to suppose that that much could be done within a span of 65 years only so this is the spirit that he want to convey this afternoon with this i thank you for your patient hearing professor uh, what is your he met you know uh, i would say that uh, just deep but he made it clear uh, and uh, his particular reading of uh, you know first that de hyphenating marx and engels so that's a uh, very important point that he he made second i uh, i would say that uh, basically you know looking at capital particularly capital volume 1 uh, something like you know uh, consisting of demonstrable uh, economic propositions that is something that he is questioning again that because we have a tendency to read uh, capital as if you know it's a text in economics and that's why this entire controversy between value and price that we came across in the uh, 60s till 60s and the other 70s also and this value price uh, controversy or trans so called transformation problem we are very much uh, familiar with you know wherever in your economics curriculum you have economics of marx then this transformation problem is something that has to be taught but today even the marxian scholars uh, no longer talk about transformation problem anymore but the point is that does it mean that we should entirely ignore this value price distinction now the present the contemporary return if you look at this uh, the scholars writings these days marxian scholars you'll find that the the problematic in fact has taken a very different kind of form for instance i'll give you some refer some uh, uh, examples now one section of the scholars they in fact try to sort of tease out uh, some of the uh, ideas from marx not just from capital 1 but capital 1 uh, capital volume 1 capital volume 1 2 3 together now that's one kind of project that people have done so if you just focus on capital volume 1 you still you are confined in the realm of production in the realm of production in the sense that you know this uh, uh, necessary labor surplus labor surplus value and then basically it's the creation or extraction of surplus value that's it but if you read if you go to capital volume 3 which is kind of messy as uh, professor fatachari said that so that's why in our readings quite often actually ignore that part that capital volume 2 and 3 because it's messier uh, so that's why we don't uh, deal with them quite often but the consequence of that is that we still confine ourselves to the realm of production and again charlie chaplin's modern times kind of uh, uh, you know uh, rhetoric that that we 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 confine ourselves to but if we if we come out of that and then look at capital volume 2 and 3 as well then you'll find that marx's true and uh, you know some kind of 
methodological uh, understanding which actually uh, gets revealed through this reading of say, volume two and three, which in fact Professor Bhattacharya uh, hinted at. That means the method is not that kind of, you know, derivable economic propositions from first volume, but actually if you, if you take the trouble of going through volume two and three, then you'll find that, you know, how complicated the way that, uh, that he actually is suggesting, the, particularly the methodological position that Marx is taking. So that's a very, I think, I would say that that's, that's the insight that we draw from Professor Bhattacharya and the contemporary Marxian scholars in fact, have, have been trying to do that. Now, what is the consequence of that? The consequence is that, in fact, we can push it further to get something out of it in terms of our, you know, the current contemporary politics also, the political economy in the contemporary world. Now, one, I, I would mention one very recent book by Mariana Mazzucato. Now, Mariana Mazzucato, what she is doing actually she, she, she is actually looking at this question of value itself, and her book is The Value of Everything. The title of the book is Value of Everything. Now, what is her, her position? Now, she is from a management school. She, she teaches in University College London, the Department of Management. And she has been working in this corporate, uh, uh, I mean, the studies on this corporate governance and all for long. Now, her position is very interesting. She says that, look around and see, see that how actually prices are taken to be values in the contemporary world. So what you actually get through the market, it looks like it's your value. But actually it's not, because prices are determined by the supply and demand, and if there is excess demand for something, prices will be high. Now that high price doesn't have any connection with the value, what we mean by value. So she is giving a very different kind of interpretation to this value theory, even though originally she is drawing from Marx's idea, but she moves away from that and trying to illuminate the contemporary reality with that distinction, that value price distinction. So you see that this is very different from our earlier economist's obsession with transformation problems. <laughs> so I think this is the kind of opening up of this, you know, uh, the, the uncharted territories that now we can venture into. Now many scholars, in fact, have been working in these areas. So that's why I, I, I found it so fascinating that Professor Bhattacharya, in fact, has uh, you know, given us that direction to move out of that capital volume one, volume one world, and you know, uh, he pushes us to go beyond volume one's that economistic interpretation. So I think this is the this is the, uh, the 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 core idea of his of his talk, and uh, again I mean the the other points are are almost like related. Uh, that you know so so one idea which always we we always share that you know whether capital should be read as a text in eco political economy or it should be read philosophically. So Professor Bhattacharya says that it should be read philosophically because it's a break from the contemporary, even from contemporary political economy, even Ricardian. But there is a tendency to again put Marx and Ricardo in the same bracket, saying that Ricardo had a kind of distributional issue and Marx also dealt with that kind of distributional issue. So that's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so Marx, was considered to be a minor Ricardian. Why? Because Marx was read from the point of view of distributional issue. But in contemporary world, we do deal with distributional issues. Just think about Thomas Piketty and the rest of it. Piketty's book is entirely deals with uh, you know, uh, distribution, that income distribution. But is there any way to relate the two? I think that, you know, uh, drawing on Professor Vattacharya's uh, clues, in fact, we can further push it in the direction that, look, I mean, distributional issues you could look at, not from Ricardian kind of perspective, which has actually been reduced to what is called functional distribution of income. That is wages, profit, and rent, and that's it, which is Ricardian, which is not Marxian. But Marx is... Uh, Look, you know, Marx's way of looking at distribution would be distribution of surplus value. Now, the surplus value will definitely be appro 
produced and appropriated by capitalists. But then the third thing is there, that is, this, how is it being distributed? So in any society, surplus value will definitely be there. That means wh whatever the workers produce, there will be some surplus value. You have to pay the you know, priests, you have to pay the police, you have to pay you know, all these other people who are not direct producers. So there are, there are a whole bunch of people who are not direct producers. So for them, in fact, surplus value has to be produced. But the question is that how this surplus value is being distributed. So who takes the decision to distribute the surplus value? Now that actually takes us to the contemporary relevance of volume three. So earlier, even the Communist Party never spent time on volume three. So all we knew that, you know, basically, you know, surplus value and rate of surplus value, profit, that's it. Even the Marxian economics that we, we are taught in classes, only this bit. But now we can see these possibilities. So, so I'm, I mean, extremely grateful to Professor Bhattacharya that, you know, he has, in fact, taken us to these new uh, territories, which quite a few Marxian uh, uh, scholars now have been sort of trying to sort of deal with. And with these few words, uh, I stop and uh, thank you uh, very much for giving us uh, so illuminating a lecture. And uh, as you can see that it's a reading, it's a reading of Marx's uh, Capital, and it's a very particular reading, but it is not an isolated reading in the sense that it's not idiosyncratic. It is actually within the social process that is reading Marx. I would say that reading Marx is a social process, and he, in fact, contextualized that his reading within that social process. Thank you very much.